You're listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. Hello, I'm Flight Lieutenant Peter Lisney, and in this episode, we tune in to highlights from the Astra Technology Exposure Day. We'll also reheat a few stories, just in case you missed them, but first, see if you can identify this noise. Find out if you're right at the end of this episode. Now, in episode 22, we heard the Apivate team's presentation at the Astra Technology Exposure Day. In this episode, we hear highlights from some of the other subjects covered at the event. This includes ongoing operations at Space Command, what a future RAF station might look like, VR to improve firefighting training, and new technology being adopted at the RAF Officer Training Academy. We are expecting uh, an increase in the number of, of catastrophic, as we say, uh, and, and significant collisions. And if we get into the realms of big data, then we're going to have to use algorithms, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence um, to do that sort of work. We can put the incumbent in a vest which heats up. Uh, they'll be wearing breathing apparatus, they'll be using a, a branch which has that real life uh, feel to it. We start at UK Space Command, which supports space operations on behalf of UK Defence. Flight Lieutenant Joe Parker spoke with Group Captain Ed Watkin about ongoing operations conducted by the Joint Force Space Component. So UK Space Command, and more specifically the Joint Force Space Component within it, is responsible uh, for the conduct of defence operations within the space domain. Uh, some examples of our routine tasking would be uh, object tracking and orbital analysis, and this may result in such things as conjunction warnings and atmospheric re-entry reporting. Uh, we also monitor missile and space launches uh, and also space weather activity. So what are the space operations that are likely to uh, happen in the next five to ten years? Uh, so touching on some of the things that uh, Mark's already spoken about, um, we would be looking to increase the amount of space service support that we could provide to uh, the UK's small satellite horizontal and vertical launch sites that are in development. Uh, and additionally, we would uh, look to uh, support the small sat constellation that we're looking to employ in the future uh, that focuses uh, on LEO that will support primarily uh, ISR functions. Could you give me an example of how these operations are interlinked? Of course. So we're casting out to 2030 and UK Defence aspires to operate our own constellation of small satellites. In order to develop and maintain those, uh, that constellation, we'll require to uh, have the capability to rapidly and dynamically uh, launch further satellites to maintain the constellation. Uh, we'll also need to have a uh, high level of awareness in the space domain in relation to both conjunctions and uh, atmospherics such as space weather. Uh, and in order to facilitate that, we're going to need to have a suite of ground sensors and systems in order to monitor that and to uh, process and analyse the data that we get. So daily operations will be able to provide safety information to UK uh, defence, uh, civil sector and also partner nations, especially with, in, in relation to critical conjunctions. Yes, exactly. Um, so we can actually um, refine predictions within the field of view of our sensors. Uh, so looking at the life cycle um, of a potential conjunction, we're constantly monitoring all the time for any additional objects that might be in orbit uh, that might indicate that we've had a collision. When we suspect uh, such, we can then uh, task our sensors to gain further observations so that we can conduct, can conduct further analysis uh, to, to refine that situation. Uh, to isolate any fragments uh, and possible debris. We can then also scan forward to identify any UK or allied assets that might, uh, might be at risk because of, because of this fragmentation. Uh, we can then also conduct uh, further analysis to determine any re-entries back into the atmosphere um, of those fragments as well. So a really collegiate effort across the, uh, the space enterprise. Um, space is truly becoming congested. Yes, definitely. Uh, so as, again, as Mark touched on earlier, um, we are expecting uh, an increase in the number of, of catastrophic, as we would say, uh, and, and significant collisions. Um, 
we're seeing an increase in both state and commercial actors operating in space, particularly in low Earth orbit, where, uh, where again, we are looking to establish our own constellation. Um, another point to add as well is that uh, within the next decade, it's highly likely that uh, debris recovery capabilities will be in use, uh, potentially even our own UK solution. Uh, whilst that has its obvious advantages, uh, it also is dual use and could potentially be used for nefarious purposes. So having a high level of domain awareness is absolutely essential. Um, equally, maintaining uh, collaboration with our partners so we can fuse that information together uh, to really build up the best possible picture we can in the domain. Still to come, we have firefighting training and technology at the Officer Training Academy. But first, we hear a lot about the future aircraft of the Royal Air Force, but what will RAF stations of the future look like? Programme Director Air Commodore Dave Tozer spoke with Squadron Leader Tony Seston about the work of the Strategic Support Programme, or SSP, one of the largest transformation programmes in the Royal Air Force today. Air Commodore Dave Tozer. So if we go back to 2015 and the Strategic Defence and Security Review, uh, the Air Force grew a little in size in terms of personnel, but it had a lot of benefits and a lot of opportunities in terms of its capability growth. So we're talking about combat air growth, um, Poseidon, E7. Uh, so the new capabilities, new platforms coming online, but they weren't all able to be funded from within the existing personnel. So the chief of the air staff at the time looked around and thought, where can we find these people? Where have we got, where have we got opportunities to um, do things better, smarter, more effective, more efficiently? And, and SSP is born out of that. So in 2017, SSP as a programme stood up and went out to look at how things are done on the stations and really looking at the support services. So support services on stations were seen as a, a real opportunity to refine, drive in effectiveness, drive in efficiency, be more economical, and effectively take people out of jobs where they're low value adding or no value adding. And if they need to be done, can we digitise it? Can we automate it? How do we streamline? How do we get rid of waste? Um, change the operating model, the way in which we work. And that creates res resilience and capacity. And then you can choose, through the change of an operating model, the way we work, the way we're structured, to take that resilience and capacity and redeploy it into growth areas, as I said, such as combat air growth, you know, Poseidon, uh, Protector, those sort of technologies. And now, with the integrated review having come out, looking at um, Space Command, which uh, stood up in April this year, um, and cyber. So those new domains and those new sort of arenas need to be resourced with people and we have to do it from what we have already. So it's about transforming the way we do business and applying our people where they add most value. And what is the programme methodology? So I've, I've kind of stolen my own sandwiches there. So the first thing is you, you look where there's waste. There's no point digitising a wasteful process. Um, so if you think of where things are handed off, and let's take a really simple example. Uh, if we go back to when I joined up in the 19, no, mid 90s, for me to put, go on leave, I'd fill in all my information, say where I'm going, what dates are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'd fill that in, put it in a, an envelope. Someone would come and take that envelope, they'd take it to PSF, and the administrators would then m make a record of it. They would brought JPA in, but I'm still doing that sort of thing to a degree. So we've got to remove the handoffs. We've got to find a way of getting the information from the user, me, into a system which allows the right things to take place rather than having everybody, lots of people being involved in the process. So streamline the process. If you can streamline the process and you can then digitise it, then you can apply automation to it. And if you can apply automation, I can put my information in and all the processes and activities that need to take place are done without human intervention. And that means we can take the human beings that were doing that work, which is low value adding, train them, up, upskill them and get them to work in areas that we value more. And those might be cyber, for example, or space. And the programme is split into projects, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we've got five projects at the moment. Um, there's HRM, Human uh, Resource Modernisation, which is actually in flight and has delivered its first project, and that's Human Resource Centres. So going away from a station personnel services flight, moving it out to six regional centres and people using digital applications to do the transactions and integrate with JPA. Uh, so that's released a, a number of workforce uh, that can be reapplied or, or saved or redeployed. Uh, then we've got C4I, which is in the process of implementing now, Aerodrome Operations and Airfield Services, uh, which is looking at how we use automation and how we refine the way we deliver a service on an airfield. So the projection of air power isn't so much of a concern. We can have that done on any station. It allows you to be more agile and adaptable. Then you've got logistics, 
which people will be aware of, whether it's you know, socks or whether it be material for um, key equipments. How do we move that around? How do we refine that supply chain and get things from the, from the point of production to the point of need as quickly as possible with as little um, handoffs? And finally, we've got engineering optimization for Typhoon, which is specifically looking at Trade Group 1 and how do we give, uh, get the most value out of those people. If we're looking at combat air growth, that allows us to reinvest those people in the right places. So people are adding most value um, to the organisation and to the teams they work in. So those are the first five projects. So, sir, looking forward, what do you think the station of the future could look like and how will SSP help deliver that? So what is it going to look like into the future? Well, anybody who says they can forecast the future, you've got to be careful about. Um, but I'd say it's going to be very different from today. And I think recent history will tell us that. So if we look at what happened during COVID, we reacted very quickly uh, to coming out of the, the standard office space. Now, that's different for a station. So there have been very different experiences. We need to capture the good um, and perpetuate that. And then we need to cease the bad bits of our, our COVID experience. But I think the thing it has told us is about connection. We need to understand where we need to be to deliver the right outputs. So I think there's, there's going to be a greater dependency on data and information, those being different things, but it's how do we exploit that data? What, does it, what is it telling us? And if we get into the brains of big data, then we're going to have to use algorithms, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence um, to do that sort of work. The, the stuff that is being delivered by the projects now is using technology to some degree. The ability to then take that data and draw greater insight from it is going to become increasingly challenging by the size of the data. So we're going to have to become more data centric. And that's the work that ACOS A6 is doing, digital optimization program is doing. Now, in the first of two sessions from RAF Cranwell, Flight Sergeant Lee Guppio and his team from the Robson Academy of Resilience have been using VR to improve the training of non-professional firefighters. He spoke with Group Captain Emma Keith. The MOD fire services were contracted uh, last year as part of the Defence Fire Rescue Project. Uh, Capita are the organisation which deliver uh, defence fire training on behalf of defence and they do it at Morton & Marsh which is the National Fire Service College. Okay, great, because obviously that cross-learning and collaboration is really important. And I just wondered, with the collaboration, what, what sort of um, relationship or connection do you have with the civilian fire service? Now that we're at Morton, uh, TG7, which is the area fire service, along with uh, CFR uh, and the Royal Navy uh, Air Handler Branch, we have the opportunity to train at the fire service college with fire services from, from all over the country so we can use our shared experiences to enhance what we do as firefighters. Brilliant, that sounds great because we can only get better, can't we, if we share our learning and, and these different environments and contexts. So that sounds brilliant. So what kind of training would you conduct with non-professional firefighters? What would you be actually doing? So the type of training that we would do would be in conjunction with, say, annual fire training, where there's a legislative requirement for personnel uh, to undergo fire training, and the head of the establishment owns that. Uh, what we've done is that we've utilised uh, virtual reality in regards to the type of training. Obviously, with your annual fire training, you're in a classroom, and uh, then you go out and then you use uh, fire extinguishers on a gas rig. What we're going to, to look at is utilising a VR system called Flame, mm -hmm. uh, which uses an extinguisher, a headset, which is then transposed onto a screen and you carry out the fire training on that. We do uh, non-professional firefighting out on, on, on stations, on establishments, and this is part of, of a legal requirement for the head of establishment to deliver annual fire training to personnel. No doubt you've done this many times uh, yourself. Uh, we also do this at Morton and Marsh as well. So we teach people to uh, service extinguishers and also we teach one particular course called the Unit Fire, Fire, Unit Fire Safety Managers course. And this helps individuals uh, keep that legislatory uh, aspect in check for the heads of establishment. So how is the fire sort of training using technology? How are you using this to enhance what you're doing? Well, since our partnership with Capita, when the Defence Fire and Rescue project took place uh, last year, we've now been given access to some of the technology that's been used at Fire Service College and the technology that's been used and implemented uh, nationwide. One of the uh, bits of technology that we're embracing at this moment in time is a system called Flame, which allows us to create a virtual reality environment in a classroom alongside the, the lesson content to immerse uh, the, the, the delegates on the courses into that environment and carry out what you would expect to, to, you, to do 
when used in an extinguisher. Yeah, and it's brilliant, isn't it? Because you very kindly, in advance of this, let me have a play with the kit, which was great fun, so thank you. Um, but it was amazing that you could really set it up for different scenarios. You could set it up in a kitchen, in an office, in a factory, so you can really see the different environments and contexts you could use this. Absolutely. The drawback from normal fire extinguisher training is that it's, it's a one-shop fits-all uh, type, uh, type of training. Uh, in this type of training, we can set it bespokely for where you work. So if you're working in an office, the fire can be office-based. If you're working in a kitchen, it can be in, in a kitchen. And we, we can set it up so that uh, anyone in that environment can, can have a go and we can give you instant feedback. Yeah, and what I found really powerful as well was that if you picked the wrong um, extinguisher, um, you could actually see the impact of using the wrong extinguisher on the, fl on the fire or even sometimes when you have the choice of two you could see the impact of the different choices you'd made. I found that really powerful and it, it stayed in my mind. Absolutely, it puts you a bit under pressure in a safe environment to choose the right extinguisher and as you said if you use say for instance a water extinguisher on a fat fire you'll see the, the adverse effects of what occurs but it won't co cause any damage because it's uh, in a virtual reality environment. Yeah, it's great. Plus it's fun, isn't it? Which it helps with the learning. It's this good fun, which is great. Um, so is the intention that people will be assessed using this? You know, um, will the instructors actually assess people when they're playing with this kit and using this kit? So we always try to keep a bit of formative assessment when we're doing any piece of training, but what this allows us to do is to give instant feedback and if necessary we can stop the scenario and have a chat about it. Uh, based on that feedback we can replay it and then the person who's been carrying out the fire extinguishing actions can add another go to see if the feedback has been effective and uh, just cement that that learning has taken place as to what's the best technique. Brilliant. This feels like a real step change. It's great. But as we're all really aware, um, technology isn't pausing, is it? You know, it's continually moving, it's continually changing, and it's a real challenge for us to stay a step ahead. So, so what's next? You know, what does the next five, ten years roll out in fire look like? What could, what could we be expecting to see? So we're always looking for new opportunities and we do expect the landscape to change in the next five or ten years. But what we're uh, trialling at the moment is a system called XVR. Where the flame system is using a headset, this is on a screen and it allows our incident commanders to carry out real life exercises in real time which will cover any fire that they would be realistically uh, expected to go to over the course of a career which can range from building fires, car fires uh, to aircraft fires and we can give them feedback on their performance without again putting them in danger. And that's just brilliant isn't it because that can only enhance safety both for the firefighters themselves that they have had chance to experience what this might be like but from my side I'm sat here thinking great they're going to have better training they're going to be more likely to have a successful outcome if I'm in that accident or that fire so um, so I really like that that's brilliant and I know from our conversations as well that they're, they're talking about sort of this um, closing that can simulate the heat and the vibrations of the fire as well. Absolutely, ma'am. Uh, so we're trialling that again. That's more in conjunction with the flame system. But where the flame, as we're trialling, is with the extinguisher, there is uh, an opportunity to, to do it from a professional point of view. So we can put the incumbent in a vest which heats up. Uh, they'll be wearing breathing apparatus, they'll be using a, a branch which has that real life uh, feel to it as they're extinguishing the fire so it gives them that realistic view of them that are actually being in the moment when they're carrying out the training. Fantastic and that's good as we said that can only help with the emotions in the moment um, and in that pressure moment can't it? Guppy that's fantastic thank you so much for that it's really helpful for us to know. In our final excerpt from the Astra Technology Exposure Day, Squadron Leader Gary Marsh asked Flight Lieutenant Linda Taylor and Flight Sergeant Martin Coleman to explain technology-enhanced learning at the RAF Officer Training Academy. The RAF Officer Training Academy trains future leaders during a 24-week modular course. For those already serving in the RAF, it starts at week seven, meaning it's an 18-week course for those. 2020 saw significant change to initial officer training Project Mercury was established to modernise initial officer training by developing an environment using state-of-the-art coaching techniques combined with technology-enhanced learning. Linda, what drove the implementation of the technology-enhanced learning at the Officer Training Academy? So our philosophy is engage, empower and enrich. And to achieve that aim, we've created an all-inclusive learning environment We've moved away from the traditional classroom training to using technology in a blended approach to learning. And Martin, you are the technology enabled learning manager at the RF Officer Training Academy, and you also work in the virtual learning environment. What can you tell us about this? 
So it was identified early on um, through the Mercury team that the benefits of technology and education were such that we needed to embrace those within the academy. How we achieved this, we identified early on that uh, a system existed within Defence already that was already accredited, and this was at Lynham. This was um, a local education resource network, also known as LEARN. Now, this solution, because it was already accredited, um, was easy to implement. It meant um, it provided Wi-Fi to all of the training estate that we've got. It provided laptops to both staff and cadets, and it also enabled us to um, use mobile Wi-Fi in our training exercise areas to fully uh, enable learning in multiple environments across our estate. The other thing it provided was a virtual learning environment. The virtual learning environment houses all of the content, all of the, um, all of the lessons and all of the kind of like resources that the cadets are going to have to use to enable them to uh, progress through the course. In addition, the academy identified that it needed a digital training management system. So I went out to tender and they selected a system from a company called Aquila. Um, it's called Aquila Learning and Risk Management System, also known to us as ALARMS. Now ALARMS um, provides um, a piece of software that is one stop for everything that we need. So it provides analysis, it provides design, it provides delivery, and it provides assurance to the academy. This enables cadets uh, to have their profiles uh, digitized so that we can track their training throughout their course. We can have a schedule on there um, so that staff, instructors can see where they've got to be, what they're studying. All lesson plans and lesson information are held on there, policies held on there, and they can also uh, answer surveys based on the course. This gives the uh, college and um, the commanding officer an insight as to what's happening within the training environment. So we can get some um, evidence-based decisions made of how we're going to train, uh, change the training in the future and improve it further. Thank you for that, Martin. Linda, if I could just ask you now, you talked about an inclusive learning environment earlier. What does that mean from what you just heard from Martin just then? Well, we get people joining the Royal Air Force from all different backgrounds and environments. For example, we could get people join straight from sixth form, having just completed their A-levels. We could get people with a vast range of skills and experience that they've gained throughout their civilian work life. Or we could get people with um, previous military experience. So it's really important that we address the learning needs of all those different types of people and that we enable them to be the best that they can be. So in practical terms, we can use the virtual learning environment in, in various ways. So, we, so an individual could attend a face-to-face classroom-based lesson, but then um, recap on their learning and um, consolidate what they've, they've learnt through using the virtual learning environment. Another way of using it would be to use it in a flipped way. So learning could happen before the lesson and then it could be confirmed and questions could be asked in a face-to-face -face way with a trainer. This is Reheat on Inside Air. I'm SAC Victoria Andrews. The Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston, has made an official visit to Singapore. He met with Major General Calvin Kong, the Chief of Air Force, discussing a strengthened bilateral relationship, cooperation of F-35B Lightning and achieving sustainability ambitions. While there, he also paid his respects at the Cranji Commonwealth War Graves Commission Cemetery, the final resting place of Commonwealth land and air forces who died in Southeast Asia in the First and Second World War. Number 6 Squadron have returned to Oria Flossiemouth from their latest deployment on Operation Shader. Officer Commanding Wing Commander Matt Dobbin described the importance of the operation. 
Operation Shader for Sixth Squadron has continued to keep the pressure on Daesh within Iraq and Syria since they lost any territory that they control. It's really important that we remain here to prevent them from having any opportunity to regain in that region. And of course, by doing so, we make the streets safer at home. The RAF has helped deliver a consignment of COVID vaccines to the North Pole. Departing RAF Bryce Norton, the vaccines were flown to Mount Pleasant Complex in the Falkland Islands. And from there, they were taken by British Antarctic Survey aircraft to the research station at Rothra on the Antarctic Peninsula. The journey was almost 10,000 miles long and crossed four continents. This is the latest delivery and means the UK has shipped vaccines to all British overseas territories. And finally in sport, England senior women's rugby union player, flying officer Amy Cochane, was on hand to inspire the next generation at the Girls' Festival of Rugby, which took place at Aurea Fulton. Over 1,000 7 to 18-year-olds took part, with 45 teams taking to the pitch in a round-robin style tournament. That's your recap of recent ORAF news on Inside Air. I'm SAC Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. No, that wasn't a Battle of Britain scramble bell. That was the sound of the bell in the queue shed at Royal Air Force Coningsby. Air crew and ground crew at RAF Coningsby, RAF Lossiemouth and the Falkland Islands are ready to launch at any time, day or night, on every day of the year. Quick Reaction Alert, or QRA for short, is ready to respond to any threats approaching Britain's airspace. Ground-based military and civilian radars across the UK monitor, detect and identify all aircraft in and around UK airspace. This is called the recognised air picture. Whether it's an unresponsive aircraft or a potential terrorist threat, armed Typhoon FGR-4 jets can be deployed within minutes, travelling at supersonic speeds to intercept threats and protect Britain's skies. That's all for this episode of Inside Air. Please give us a review and subscribe on your favourite podcast app and join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.